Okay. I am assuming everyone can hear us, and if they can't, do you just say um, say something in the chat or make a note or wave your hand or something. It's a huge, huge welcome to everybody. Um, my name's Ruth, uh, Ruth Dance or Dance, depending on how you pronounce it or which part of the country you're from. Um, and I am um, the MD of the Employee Engagement Alliance. If this is the first webinar or event you're joining um, with us, warm welcome, warm welcome to all our members, everyone that's part of our community, um, clients of People Lab, and people who generally wanted to know what the latest research was again this year. So, huge welcome to everyone. Um, I'm really excited. I can't believe a whole year has passed since we last did this webinar with Emma and uh, to understand more about what the employee engagement gap was and what it was all about and what to do about it. Um, and I'm really, I'm really excited to hear what the latest research is. The um, spotlight research that people love to do every year um, is not only hugely interesting but hugely beneficial and really helps shape what we do and I'm sure many of you what you do for the year. This um, webinar is an exclusive preview to the results that have not yet been uh, announced or shared. So if you are taking the time to join us, then um, uh, this is, is a hugely exciting time. This webinar is being recorded, so we will make sure we post the recording on our blog for people to listen to um, after as well for them, anyone that wasn't able to make it. If anyone has any questions, do feel free to pop them in the Q&A or the chat feature on here. Um, or drop me an email, I'll make sure I keep an eye on my emails throughout. Um, and uh, do get in touch if you want to get involved in any webinars in the future, or speak at any of our events, or get or have any suggestions for content, contacts, um, or anything that you'd like to hear about. So, um, I'll start making a bit of an introduction into who you're going to be hearing from this afternoon. So, Emma, Emma Bridger is the director of People Lab, and as we were just talking before we hit record on the webinar, um, People Lab have it's now in their 10-year anniversary. So mm. congratulations on that, Emma. Um, and another year um, of your spotlight research. So this is what year three, year yeah. four now. Year three, yeah. Uh, year three of the spotlight research, um, where you go about conducting some incredible research into what's going on in the employee engagement. Um, area or industry and um, whatever you want to call it and share with you as your fascinating results which really help us throughout the year um uh some of the themes um from last year um from what i remember um you're really stretching my memory here but some of the themes from last year um that came out of your research was that many organizations actually um or many organizations or i'll switch that around very few organizations um, actually have a more formal employee engagement strategy. Um, the dial in employee engagement, while there's been a lot of talk about the subject, um, the dial really hasn't shifted all that much over the last three years. Um, uh, many organisations had no budget or very little budget to spend on employee engagement and what they were spending was just on their employee survey. Um, uh, many of which was just once a year. Um, there was also very little measurement or any way of demonstrating the ROI. So I remember some of those key themes from last year's research and being quite uh, surprised by that. So I'm really interested to hear um, from Emma um, on has the dial shifted? Because I was shocked last year that it, it hadn't. Um, has the dial shifted or um, are we still just talking about something and not really putting our money and motivation behind it? Before I hand over to you, Emma, I'm gonna do a cringeworthy introduction to you because I know you don't always do yourself justice. So Emma. <laughs> Emma is a leading employee engagement expert. She um, was a, uh, or maybe maybe still is, but a le lecturer in psychology and more specifically in uh, health psychology, I think. Um, Emma specialises in be behavioural change and has over 20 years in the world of employee engagement. I said this last year, I'll say it again because she's not aged an awful lot in the last year. <laughs> she doesn't look like she um, has uh, managed to rack up 20 years of uh, experience in employee Bless engagement. <laughs> Um, and I know your experience, Emma, has both been in-house, in small, large, private, public, different types of organisations and also agency side. Emma's also designed and delivered courses on employee engagement for the CIPD and the Institute of Internal Comms. Um, Emma, you're a regular conference speaker. You spoke at one of our events recently. Um, and you also have just brought out, well, probably six months ago now, um, your um, second edition of your best-selling book, um, so congratulations on, on, Thank you. on that. So there's there's my cringeworthy introduction to Emma. Um, I'm sure you'll you'll learn more about Emma throughout this webinar. But um, going back to the themes of 
uh, what happened last year in the webinar and the results from the spotlight research. I'm really excited Emma, for you to share the latest results. So over to you. I'll just make this presentation bigger so everyone can, can see awesome. it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth, for that, um, that glowing introduction, but I have a lot to live up to now. <laughs> okay, so um, just, yeah, there's, there's, there's me 10 years ago, I don't look like that anymore. Um, let's, let's move on to the next slide. Um, the employee engagement gap. So this is really the context around why we started the Spotlight Research three years ago. Um, we're really interested in the fact that, you know, uh, it, it's been a real growth area employee engagement. I mean, if you look at the kind of Google analytics around the people searching for the term, you know, you could really see a clear trend and it. it doesn't show any signs of, of, of declining. You know, it, it's a real sort of hot topic. People are talking about it. There's money being invested in it. There are new consultants popping up pretty much, um, you know, every month in the area. Um, you know, it, it's a hot topic. We know people are interested in and working on engagement. So a few stats here. Um, you know, uh, the Deloitte stats, I think, is, is pretty interesting. It, it just reflects what we've seen over the past few years, that it's an area of priority for most organisations. Um, but we're not very good at it. So, you know, depending on which report you want to look at, you can look at the likes of Gallup, you can look at the likes of Aon. Um, global employee engagement levels are not great. Um, with all this time, attention, effort, that we are, you know, focusing on employee engagement, you would sort of expect us to be a lot better at it than we are. So this is why we started the research three years ago. We wanted to find out kind of what, well, why are we seeing this gap? There's a bit of a contradiction there. And um, as Ruth said, I started my sort of career many years ago as a psychologist. So I've kind of always got that little um, bit of curiosity around, you know, research and finding out what's really going on. So that was kind of the backdrop to um, Spotlight, why we started it three years ago. So we just move on to the next slide. Um, the, the headlines, I guess, are um, sorry, Ruth. You can move on to the next one. The headlines are, but, you know, a, a spoiler alert here. News in. Um, this is the first year we're starting to see the early signs um, that the gap's beginning to close. So there's kind of first green shoots, and you know, I don't want to get too excited, but I am naturally kind of a fairly excitable, enthusiastic person. Um, the, this is the first year we've seen things start to uh, to change, and um, really interestingly, I'll, I'm going to go through all the results um, today. Well, not all the results, but the ones I think you'd be interested in. And and obviously, you can download the reports um, from tomorrow if you're interested in kind of getting under the skin of it. Um, but pretty much across most of the the areas of practice that we research in the, in this piece. We've seen improvements, not necessarily massive improvements, but we've seen things starting to move in the right direction. And that really correlates to what we're seeing in a bigger picture around global engagement levels. So if you look at the likes of research from Aon, from Temkin Group, from a factory, from um, Gallup even, you know, and CIPD as well, we are seeing um, improvements in engagement levels. Some, you know, are maybe only one or two percent. Some are kind of more like five, six percent. Some are even eight percent. But we're definitely seeing things start to move. So I think this is kind of, um, you know, I'm being tentative here, but I think this is signs for, uh, you know, optimism around the fact that the practice, the profession, is changing. People are starting to do more of the right things, and we are therefore starting to see that play out in these increases in global engagement levels. That's my hypothesis anyway, and that's what I think we're starting to see. So I think that's really great news. So let's just have a little look to go underneath um, what's been going on. So um, we spoke to um, 109 organizations in, in this tranche of the research. Um, the majority were based in the UK. But we did have companies from all over the globe get involved, and we'd really like to see more international involvement next year. So. Um, if you're listening and you're from um, outside the UK, please get involved and spread the word when we run this, this what will be later this year. Um, and, and all sectors are represented. There's no kind of trend really around one sector being more representative in the research. It really does kind of cover all industries. And um, when you download the, the, the full findings, you'll be able to get a breakdown of, of kind of the size of organisations. But again, a pretty clear kind of um, split over different sized organizations. So, you know, small, medium, and large are all in there and all represented. So if we go on to the next slide, um, what we're going to look at first 
is the um, this, this are the changes around resourcing and structure. We've seen some really interesting moves this year. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, one of the questions that we ask is around job title because um, we find when we go out and speak to people that you know people that are involved in employee engagement don't necessarily have that in the job title. They can have all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful job titles. And you know we, we saw the results here around job title fairly similar to last year, not not a huge amount of movement. Um, but the reason I wanted to put this on here, again, in terms of those kind of early signs, you'll see that people with culture in their job title and people with experience in their job title appeared in the list for the first time. Now, although there's only 2% of people with experience in their job title, that didn't that didn't feature you know, the last couple of years we've run this. And I know that there's been a lot of debate this year around, or last year around, engagement versus experience and, and I certainly blogged on the subject so I just wanted to flag that because it's interesting that um, you know culture and experience is starting to creep into the, the lexicon that we use when it comes to engagement in terms of job title anyway and the rest of us have been using those, those terms for a long time. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, there's still no obvious home for engagement so again just wanted to kind of flag this I think it's useful info maybe interesting info for practitioners to see that it can fit in all sorts of different places. There's no obvious home for engagement. So um, majority are sitting in HR, but quite a good portion are also in comms and almost 10% are in marketing. And I guess my question is, how much does the, uh, the place that you sit as a, an engagement professional impact the work that you then do? And I know going back to my in-house days, um, I did 10 years in-house working for big corporates and I looked after comms and engagement. And I know that I sat in a variety of places um, in the strategy department, in the HR department, in the, in the, in the um, marketing department. And I definitely had some pressure from my senior stakeholders to take a different focus depending on where I sat in the organisation. So I think that, my, my, again, my hypothesis is that's probably still the case. So moving on to the next slide, I um, wanted just to look a little bit at the, the areas of time and people. So we asked um, what percentage of your job role is dedicated to, um, to employee engagement activities. And again, fairly similar results to last year if you look at the kind of the bigger picture around kind of almost sort of 50-50 split between those that have got less than 50% and those that have got more than 50%. But you'll see that those that have got a good chunk of their time, i.e. 75 to 100% just focused on engagement, has declined um, 12 percentage points from last year, although we see more in the 50 75%. So um, that, that was quite interesting. But if you then kind of overlay that onto the next um, piece of data there, how many people have formal responsibility for delivering your engagement strategy or, or, or tactics? Um, we've seen a kind of increase in the number of people that have responsibility for engagement. And again, I'm interested in running some further research on this and to find out how people are answering this. So we've seen um, it basically team sizes get bigger here, I think. So we're saying four more responsibility. So we're saying that's kind of a different thing to, um, to kind of everybody has responsibility for engagement, which of course they do in some way. Um, so these are people that actually kind of have it as part of their job description. Um, so that, that, that's gone up. Um, so there's been quite significant increases in, in size of teams there, which I think, again, is, is really good news. So there's some interesting findings there. So moving on to the next slide, um, we wanted to ask practitioners about the strategy and plans. Um, and again, what we've seen here are some really interesting and quite significant improvements compared to last year. So we just move on to the next slide. Um, I, I was really pleased to see that um, those having a definition and a strategy in place, has, has, you know, both of those results have gone up. Although they're still not where you'd want them to be, you know, huge improvement on last year. So we've seen 13% of company, companies more likely to have, have a, a definition this year, and um, having a strategy is up 10% compared to last year. So still not where we want it to be, but that, so that's a good improvement. So, you know, 10% improvement in any one year is, is something that, you know, is not to be taken lightly. That, that's good. It's good we're seeing that. And in addition, um, again, 10% increase on, um, 
you know, people reporting that engagement is well measured. So I think that's a really good, solid step in the right direction for taking a more strategic, you know, approach to engagement, which we need to do if we're going to have any kind of impact on engagement levels. You know, if we just kind of, you know, do some stuff and hope that it works, you know, then it, we're not going to make a difference. But if we take a strategic approach, we're much more likely to, to have success in improving engagement. So moving on to the next slide, um, just wanted to give you a little bit of background around defining engagement. Um, of the 27% that have a definition, um, again, we've seen that this is much, uh, much better understood than it was compared to last year. So, um, you know, 11% more likely to say, or 11% increase on it being well understood, um, and, you know, again, increases on, on, on those other areas as well. So what I guess I'm saying here is the trends are that things are getting better, we're taking solid steps in the right direction. So moving on to the next slide, um, I'm just going to talk about enablers um, for a couple of minutes. So I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the enablers and engagement, first cited by McLeod and Clark in their 2009 report to government. Um, and they're a good framework for engagement, um, have been shown to kind of make a difference to success really when it comes to engagement. Um, it isn't really the case that, that one is better than the other, that they're all useful. And it depends obviously on your strategy as to which enabler you might be focusing on, you might be focusing on all of them. What's interesting here is we've seen line managers go down slightly, and I'll talk about my thoughts on why that might be um, in a second, but we've seen um, really big increase this year in the focus on employee voice. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant increase on employee voice. Strategic narrative's gone down a few percent, but nothing necessarily significant there. Um, involvement, again, not really significant, but integrity is the other enabler that we've seen a huge increase in. So a lot more organisations focusing on voice and integrity. And I think, um, again, a hypothesis here may or may not be the case, but if you look at the backdrop to what's happening in the UK, particularly at the moment, around a lack of trust, um, it may be that that's where that kind of focus on integrity has come from. But interested to hear what you guys think. So moving on to the next slide, um, I would like to think, and again, this is kind of a uh, conjecture on my part, but I would, I would like, I would love to think that um, the reason that we are seeing uh, a slight decrease in the focus on, on managers is because previously that was the enabler that had the most focus, and it had the most focus, and we are starting to see some positive benefits for that focus on that enabler. So what I'm saying here is that this year um, we heard that um, you know 20 percent increase uh, of companies saying that managers have got a good understanding of what engagement is. So up from 28 percent to 48 percent and a nine percent increase um, of companies telling us that managers support the need to focus on engagement. I would love to think that is a direct result of that previous high focus on managers when it comes to engagement. It may not be, but it's interesting. There's certainly a correlation there, I think. Um, so again, we'd love to hear what, what you guys think on that. So moving to the next slide, um, again, talking about sort of strategy and practice, um, we, we definitely need to do more in the area of measurement and, and demonstrating ROI. So um, again, great positive steps in the right direction. So um, a ten percent increase in um, engagement being well measured, so people report and they think it's much, uh, you know, measurement is much better now. Um, but we are still not seeing that translate into demonstrating return on investment. So for me, you know, this is really vital because the way that we kind of get buy-in and support from, from uh, stakeholders is to measure what we do was have a strategy, know what we're going after, measure what we do, and then demonstrate that it's worked and it's positively impacted the, the business. So this is why this, this slide is so important. So again, step in the right direction, but still needs to do more here. Um, good news of budgets as well. So we've seen increases this year in, in budgets. So you can see very clearly there that the, um, you know, the kind of categories here have, have increased and we're seeing, um, you know, the no budget, although the no budget has gone up slightly, equally we've seen kind of other budget areas go up. So I think overall the picture that I would take, or the message I would take away from this is that 
there's more money kicking around. There's, there's more people that have got money to spend, so which is great news. So again, um, yeah, good, good to hear that. Um, so moving on to the next slide, how are people spending the money? Um, really interesting here because um, this is the first time that we've seen more budget being allocated to what happens after the survey and the survey itself. And for me, this again is that sort of those sort of first green shoots of um, practitioners beginning to, to move towards a more transformational approach to engagement than a transactional approach to engagement. So we talk about transaction engagement as typically, you know, reactive, acting on stuff that comes out of the survey, you know, looking at what's not working, how can we fix it, and then kind of moving on and ticking things off a list. Um, so the fact that we're starting to see a bit more money allocated to what happens with the results of the survey and the survey itself, I think is a great signal that we're moving in the right direction. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, what we did find though was there was a lack of synergy in some areas between budget allocation and priorities. So again, I won't go through this in detail. If you download the full report, you'll be able to see that in, in, in detail in terms of every area that was kind of cited as having budget allocated to it and every area that was cited as a priority. Um, I guess what's interesting here, you know, there, there were some synergies around you know, the survey, what happens after it, but for example, I'll, pu I'll pull out one here, culture change. People are saying culture change is a, a, a key priority, and yet that didn't come out in terms of the budget allocation. Now, that could be because people already know what they're going to do tactically to change culture, and they're, they're kind of answering it in that way. So, you know, we're putting money into events, for example, because that's the way we're going to sort of kick, kick, kick start culture change. But interested in, in, in um, I guess, diving into that a little bit more, is it because, um, so, so a couple of, couple of ideas as to why we're seeing this. One, it could be that lack of strategy. If I haven't got a strategy in place, then I'm probably not going to be, you know, allocating money where I need to spend it because I haven't kind of gone through that proactive thought process. So it could be that. It could be because practitioners don't have autonomy over how they spend their budget. So they might believe, there's a high priority around, um, you know, employee voice, for example. We really need to prioritise that. But um, perhaps they, the budget allocation is not down to, to their discretion and the stakeholders that are deciding where the budget is spent don't believe that that's a priority. So for me, it really comes back to the need, again, to, to start with that strategic approach because, you know, making the case for strategy then, you know, what falls out of that is kind of agreement and alignment on, on budget allocation of priorities. So moving on to the next area, um, skills and capabilities. So somewhat frustratingly, so just move on to the next slide, this is the one area in, in the study that jumped out as, as, as not improving this year. And I think this is a real red flag and it's something that could, could um, really be a barrier to all those improvements we're seeing, all those steps in the right direction. I think if we don't get this right, it's really going to kind of halt our progress. So we've seen a decline in both, um, you know, focus on developing skills and capabilities in managers and in practitioners. Um, this was the, the biggest difference in the whole survey. So we saw in the previous survey that 57% had allocated budget to develop and train managers only 90% had allocated budget to do that this year. Now, that could be because um, budget isn't required because um, developing skills and capabilities is happening in-house, with in-house training teams. Great, if that's the case, wonderful. But that's a bit alarming, I think. So why aren't we really focusing on, on helping line managers, you know, um, to, to understand what this is all about, how they can help? And, and coaching was also down 5% as well. And again, I think that's, that's a real red flag. Um, and only 26% of the practitioners we spoke to had received any kind of formal training in, uh, in, in 2018. And again, that was down 3% compared to 2017. I'd want to see that go in the other direction. So I think there's a real um, opportunity for, for us to, to look at this and think about how we can turn that around. Um, there's a real need to create experts in this field. It's not something you can just, you know, uh, wake up one day and know how to do it. So a huge amount of expertise and needed to become a, uh, you know, fully crafted engagement practitioner. Um, and I think, you know, we need to really recognise that. So something we'll be we're looking at more this year. So moving on to the next slide. Um, 
the barriers to engagement, very similar to last year. So we're hearing people say line managers are a barrier, but we're not going to allocate any budget to, to helping them to, you know, to, 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 to try to fix this and remove them as a barrier. Um, and, you know, people are still saying we need more resources, we need more money, we need more understanding. Poor communication as core comms always gets a bit of a, an ear bashing, doesn't it, when it comes to anything really. We blame comms. And um, somewhat frustratingly, what we found in the research was we kind of need more context to understand how and why comms are a barrier to engagement. Um, so, again, that's something we're going to be diving into a little bit more detail this year and measurement as well. So, on to the next slide. In summary, then, what have we found? Just to kind of um, sum up the findings and provide some recommendations. So, um, managers and, and, and stakeholders have now got a better understanding of engagement and are more likely to, to support ready to focus on it. But there's still work to be done. We know that there's less investment in their training development and we know they're still seen as a barrier. So, step in the right direction, more work to do. Structural role, interesting this year, we still don't have an obvious home and with and practitioners are still having to juggle engagement responsibilities with a whole range of other activities. But on the plus side, those who have formal responsibility for engagement is on the increase and we've got a little bit more budget than, than previous previous years. And strategic approach, again, positive steps in the right direction. So we are seeing more um, companies with a definition and a strategy and more are measuring their impact, but it's still less than half. Um, on to the next slide. Um, budget versus priorities. So we're seeing some conflict there around budget and priorities. So um, we kind of need, I think, to, to sort of dig under the skin of that a little bit more to understand why that's happening. And building capabilities is an area that I think we really need to, to kind of revisit and say, actually, this is important. We need budget to make sure that people that are involved in this um, area have got the skills and capabilities they need, not just practitioners but managers as well. And I think overall, we are starting to see early signals that we are moving towards or making some moves towards transactional engagement. Again, in the, the, the full report, you'll see, for example, that um, uh, although the survey still features large, we're seeing a, a move towards more regular pulse type of surveys and a move away from the annual or biannual survey. So we're definitely seeing kind of insight being sought more, more regularly. Um, and uh, I think the, the other factors in this, this the research have shown that people are starting to take this sort of baby steps towards more transformational engagement. So if we move on to the next slide. So in terms of recommendations, what's this mean? Um, I think that um, we are starting to see the Derby move, which is great. Um, I guess the recommendations aren't that different from last year. There's the same sort of stuff in there. Um, it's really start with strategy and put a strategy in place. Can't stress that enough. And um, it's frustrating that more practitioners are doing, doing this. You know, it, it, for me, everything else falls out of this. You get a strategy in place. You understand what you're doing while you're doing it. You get that stakeholder buy-in. And you can make sure you're focusing on the right things. Um, developing expertise, again, still critical to do that. And continue to invest for success and demonstrate ROI. I think it's a piece around aligning the, the priorities and budget. Again, a good strategy will help you to do that. Um, and just really thinking about how you move towards transformational engagement. And you know, we've got lots of resources that can help you. At a lots of free resources, I should say, free resources. You know, because we believe, you know, we believe in helping your organisations to do this stuff. So lots of free stuff we can, you know, share with you to help you a develop your strategy and b make moves towards transformational engagement. And the other area is that, you know, we've also got some more um, commentary and analysis around tech and the use of apps. And we are seeing more companies using apps. Um, but I think still largely, you know, there's a kind of a, about a quarter of employee, uh, not employees, sorry, a quarter of, of, of respondents said they're still undecided, still not sure if they should be investing in this area. And again, if you've got a strategy in place that helps you decide whether or not that it's the right tactic for you and what you want to achieve. So those are the recommendations, um, and over to you now for any questions, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. So yes, if anyone's got any questions, do type them into the Q and A or the chat feature, and I'll make sure that um, I get them. I get them to Emma. Um, Emma, it's um, fantastic. Not only that you've done this research again for another year and made it global, and thank you so much. But it's great to hear 
what's changed and actually it's nice to hear this year that things are changing and yeah it's probably in some areas that things things really are changing the thing that stood out for me out of all of your research is um this, this move to transformational that we're getting there finally um and and it feels like we're we're moving away from the transactional and that bit around there's more budget after the survey now being allocated yeah. than for the survey is just it's so refreshing to hear that because so many people I've spoken to have said my role is the survey or yeah. all our money goes on the survey so we've got no we've got no money for anything else so that's um that it's really refreshing to hear and it feels like a step in the, in the right direction albeit a slow one um and then the, the the second piece for me that that stood out is developing the experts in this field and um that's really well obviously it's really nice for us to hear because that's what we're about we're trying to help people to learn, connect, learn from one another and become experts in this field through hearing from one another. Um, do you believe that having formally accredited programmes, um, formal competency frameworks and things like that in place will be essential to success in driving the, the, the figures higher in this area? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I meet lots of people out and about on the travels at events and, you know, clients and previous clients and and you know the people that, that I meet are, are all really passionate about this area this subject and um, whether you give it a class of engagement or not whether you're using internal comms to engage your workforce in your new strategy or whether you're looking at well-being you know there's so many different branches and areas of engagement but what I tend to find is that you know the majority of people that, that kind of end up with the formal responsibility for engagement, whatever that looks like, whatever their job title is, have often kind of fallen into that role. Um, and they may be really good at one aspect of it. For example, they may fall into it via the survey. They may be a really good kind of research scientist. Um, but there may be other areas that, that they, they don't really understand. For example, the internal comp side of this or the, um, you know, the, the line manager and coaching side of it. So I think it's a, it's a really fabulous place to be, you know, to, to have a formal responsibility for improving how it feels to a community organisation. And I think, you know, to, we need to support um, practitioners out there with a, a formal recognised accredited programme um, that we, you know, we develop in partnership with them so that they can, uh, you know, feel proud of what they do, feel that it's recognised, um, but also ensure that they've got the skills and competences they need and if, if they you know, if there are areas that, that they you know aren't there as a strength, they know that they they can identify that and know they need to bring someone in or get some help in, you know in particular that particular areas that perhaps aren't their their own strength of expertise. So what we're going to be doing this year is, is really looking at this and seeing how we formalise this and how we uh, develop some kind of accredited um, you know uh, program so people can have that kind of professional status within this field. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I know that's something we've been talking about. For yeah. a while now, and it's great to hear that that's actually come out of your research as mm. well. That is that this is something that's needed. So, if anyone has any suggestions on how we can help them with their development and help them with uh, this formal accreditation, or help them become an expert in the field of employee engagement, then then do let us know what your what your needs are and what your recommendations are as well. Um, that would be hugely helpful. So look out for that next bit of research from us. Um, I've got a couple of questions from some of our attendees, so it's not all good asking, Emma. So um, I don't know if this is a question or more of a statement, but it's definitely something that um, I've, I've heard before. So this is from Nicola, who says, um, employee engagement sits between both HR and internal comms in my organisation. And I know it did in organisations that I've worked in previously mm. as well, Nicola. Um, but as an internal comms expert, I struggle to wrestle with how we can provide the influence in this area without being seen to stand on the HR toes. Yeah, yeah, and I, it's definitely something I can relate to um, from, from my years working in house. It was kind of either the HR folks were relieved that I was doing it and weren't really interested. It was something, you know, one less thing on their to-do list at one end of the scale. All the HR folks were incredibly territorial and sort of saying, "Well, why, you know, why, why are you messing in on my area?" Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what, what's really interesting about engagement is it does need this kind of cross um, department approach. We, we used to talk about a collegial approach, which people didn't really know what we were talking about. Probably be a little bit academic with that, but it needs, um, you know, a network of different individuals to be sat around the table, even though. It, formal responsibility might sit with a person or a team, 
you know, it's one of those disciplines and areas where you kind of need to get a whole bunch of people around the table, you know, everyone from the kind of very sort of um, pure HR, L&D, um, OD types through to even, you know, facilities in terms of how it feels to, you know, work in the organization, um, well-being, diversity and inclusion, corporate social responsibility, data, data scientists, um, your brand people, your absolutely your internal comms people, um, and there's no easy answer. Um, uh, you know, some organisations, you know, the culture was such that it, it was easier to do that than other organisations. And you know, I've, I've also had it at the end scale where it's been incredibly difficult, and you sort of thought, well, what's the difference I can really make here? So probably no, no simple, easy fixes there. But I think just recognition in the first instance that you need a whole bunch of different disciplines sat around that table because they all have an impact on how it feels to work in the organisation. And actually, with um, the rise of employee experience, I think people are getting their heads around that a bit more because I think it's more it's more tactical and tangible and easy to understand that to have a great experience, you need all these different people sat around the table. So that, that could be a way of, of approaching it, maybe. I agree. Um, I, I know of um, uh, Aviva, for example, the insurance company that have a workplace experience team in place and they sit across all different divisions but particularly within facilities and mm. I think this rise of experience and talking more about experiences helps us to understand that it's from the moment we walk in the door and what the floor looks like through to how we log into the systems that we use and that's many different departments not just um, and where, where previously it's been transactional probably led out of HR probably led out of a someone that has surveyed as part of their responsibility, it is more of that collegial approach. Um, finding organisations that are doing it well, um, if we find any, we will we will let you know, <laughs> but we will uh, definitely um, keep that one uh, in mind when we're looking at what that um, expert in that field looks like. Yeah. Well. It's, it's probably not a shock, but um, one of our clients, Virgin Atlantic Vision Holidays, and you know, they are they're often held as poster boys for engagement. Um, but, you know, regardless of that, you know, working with them as a client, they, they genuinely, you know, work really collectively and collaboratively mm -hmm. together. And when we've worked on projects with them, we you know we've been working, for example, with employee relations, um, as well as internal comms, as well as the OD and the HR guys, so, you know, and, and the facilities guys. So I really felt that they, that they, they are very good at having that kind of uh, collaborative, collegial mm -hmm. approach. Yeah, some of the best success I had was when I moved out of HR, actually, and into customer experience. Mm. I actually sat in the marketing department, so we reported yeah. into the chief marketing officer, and I was bringing employee engagement, employee experience, I guess it wasn't called it then, um, and my HR and L&D experience, but into a role that sat within customer experience, and really able to see those direct links between customer experience and um, employee experience from measurement through to what that meant for the bottom line of the business. Mm. Actually, a question that's just coming from James is, and, and, and this is probably aimed at you, Emma, James, correct me if it's not, but um, have you seen any trends in how the employee experience or engagement is being linked to customer experience or engagement and uh, organizational strategic level? Hi, James. That's a really great question. Um, I, I think the trend, but this is just kind of my own view rather than scientifically kind of ratified, you know, evidence view. But um, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, we've seen a huge increase in focus on experience and is it engagement with experience, people having to have experience in the job title. And I think there's a, a, so much that we can learn from the customer experience folks. Um, my sister actually is in customer experience at Barclays. We have some really interesting <laughs> conversations we think yeah, the rest of the family are not, not convinced <laughs> you know we, we, we're miles behind you know and, and, and I've always had a frustration with, with how kind of the customer was always the, the primary focus so you know think about the amount of kind of research and data points we have for customer and customers and how we you know we their satisfaction and their um you know their, their, all, all of that sort of stuff and and brand and, and you know the, the the customer brand side of things and then kind of the inside of the organization internally was always kind of the, the, the poor cousin um and they just don't have the, anywhere near the budgets that the marketing guys have but i think there's with the increase in um customer experience as a, as a kind of a topic there's definitely um, people are talking about it more, people are reaching out to experts in customer experience more, saying, well, what can we learn from you about things like the customer journey? How can we apply those sorts of principles internally? 
um, some of the more sort of design thinking sort of principles internally. Um, and I think it's a really interesting and a fertile ground for some creativity and some new ways of working, some different thinking. So I'm I'm really excited by it. Um, I I don't think it's a you know I don't think employee engagement and experience are the same thing. And I think they're absolutely linked and related. Of course they are. I don't think it's an either or. Um, so I think we should lose sight of engagement because it's you know for me it's kind of absolutely related. So. Um, but in terms of trends, I don't, yeah, I think the only trend I've seen is just more people talking about employee experience and looking to learn from their counterparts in, in customer experience. This is outside of your research, which is probably what James logged on to hear, not necessarily to hear from me, but I'm starting to hear, hear more organisations looking at that correlation between NPS and now employee NPS. Yeah. Um, they're starting to measure their glass door scores along their, alongside their trust pilot scores. Mm. And they're starting to look at the correlation from a mm. measurement perspective, um, mm. which is which is quite nice to see. I think it's a shame that we're actually learning from the customer experience guys and applying it internally. It probably should have been done the other way around yeah. in the day, but you know, we're probably fifty years too late for that. Yeah, that's but, um, years ahead, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but actually there's some organizations I'm seeing that are turning themselves around from 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 the ground um, uh, from breaking point almost and saying we're going to turn ourselves around but we're going to do it from the inside out so we're actually going to look at our employee experience and really focus on engagement within the organization to drive the right the right scores or the right um, experience we want for our customers so that's quite refreshing to see there's not many organizations doing that but if you want to hear of any great case studies um, and you're not attending the employee engagement awards um, Gala on Thursday at Twickenham, then do let me know because I could definitely point you in the direction of some fantastic CEOs who are doing some great work in that space. Um, question from Michael, and then I think we'll wrap up because we're at the 45 minute mark now, Emma. Is um, and this pro I, I think Michael, this is relating to the research. Um, do the different organisations get weighted when it comes to size? No. Okay. No. <laughs> um, no, it's not that complex. Um, I mean, I could get all really nerdy about about research. It's my sort of background as a research scientist, but um, no, they're they're not. At the, 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 the moment, at this moment in time, it's just a kind of a very straightforward look into what people are doing. Um, and you know, we we've got 106 companies involved, which which is great. But we we would you know to kind of look into sort of weighting and those sorts of things, we would need a, a much bigger um, pool, a much bigger response rate to be able to do that. But you know, in the future, I'd love this to see this grow year on year and get a, you know more and more companies involved um, because I think it's so valuable and the insight is really interesting. So, but it, you know, it's a very small response rate at 106 companies. So, so no weighting as yet. Great. Well. As yet, Emma, we'll see what happens next year, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Emma, thank you. Like I said, if anyone... Um, uh, oh, I do have one more question. I, th I, th I hope this question is useful and it's worth staying on the line for anyone that's still here. What do you anticipate is going to crop up in these results next year? Well, <laughs> either... <laughs> I'm hoping, I'll put my optimistic cap on, I'm hoping that we continue to see these sort of green, first green shoots of improvements and, and move towards a more transformational approach to start to really take root and, and, and you know, be bigger and braver and, and, you know, stronger and go from little roots to sort of bigger plants, if you like. I'm really hoping that's the, the, the trend that we see. Um, that's what, yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Great. So... To do that, we're going to have to follow your recommendations, develop yeah. some experts in the yeah. field, and focus more on transformational, not just get a strategy in place, guys. And we've got yeah. to already get one in place. It's, you know, <laughs> it's not rocket science. You can do it. We've got free stuff. Just use the free stuff and get a strategy in place because it will make the world a difference. Great. So get some free stuff from Emma, or come and learn what all the great organisations are doing by being part of um, our community, coming to our events, that sort of thing. And look out for the research we'll be doing on developing the experts in this field. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Not only for conducting all this research, but sharing and giving our members the exclusive preview. Um, huge thank you for that. So, as I said, this recording will be live on our website tomorrow, um, along with access to the report for everybody. And if you're um, watching this in a recording, I hope you found it useful. Thank you, everyone that attended live today from all over the globe. And um, we hope to see many of you over the next few weeks.
Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot, Ruth. Good to speak to you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.